3, verses 6 through 9. And by the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the word stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful to have this first day of the week to be able to gather as your children to worship you. Father, we pray that you would help us for the next few moments to focus on you, to realize that uh, all that we are doing is to uh, glorify and to honor you. Father, we pray that through our praise and worship that we may uh, give you honor and glory. Pray that we may also be encouraged, that we may encourage one another, that we may lift each other up, that we may learn more about you, that we may grow closer to you. Father, we pray that, uh, that you would help us to take the things that we study and learn here today, find ways to apply them to our life so that we can walk closer to you. Father, we, we know that you are the source of all good things. We know that you have blessed us in so many ways. And Father, it would be impossible for us to count all the things that, that you have done for us. But Father, we uh, pray that you would help us to have thankful hearts Father, we pray that you would help us to be able to take our blessings and 
and share with others, help those who are in need. Father, we uh, pray at this time that you would be with those who are not able to come and worship with us today, for those who would desire to be here, those who are struggling and, and hurting. Uh, we know there are uh, many in our family here. Uh, we have friends and loved ones who are sick and struggling. Father, we just pray that if it be your will that you would be with them and bless them with improved health, that they may be able to return and worship with us again. Father, we uh, are mindful that uh, we struggle with sin. We're thankful that you have provided salvation. We're thankful that you sent your son to this earth uh, to be the offering for our sin. Father, we just pray that you would help us to uh, daily walk in the light so that the blood of Christ would cleanse us of our sins. We pray that uh, you would forgive us of our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. And Father, we uh, pray that in all things that we do, that we would focus on Christ and, and focus on the cross and the sacrifice that he made for us. And it's through the name of Christ we pray. Amen. You were despised. You were rejected. Lord,
As we come to the point in our service this morning that we uh, partake of the Lord's Supper, I want to tell you about, or talk to you for just a second, about a couple of tables. The first table I want to tell you about is the, the dinner table at a firehouse. It is a big, long table where all of us gathered around for our dinner meals. People of different color skin, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different levels of education, different, different points in our life, different periods of our life, from the, the newest rookie to the, the old uh, salty captain of the firehouse. And we would all come together and we would share that meal with each other. And in my mind, it was, I always thought of it as the table of truth. Because at that table is where the truth always came out. If, if there was somebody who was shirking on their duties just a little bit, somebody would always throw a jab or two out there just to kind of get them back in line and make sure that what they were doing was for the best of the team. If, if we had made a fire earlier that day or if, uh, if we'd had a fire the shift before, we would talk about that fire uh, and discuss what happened and because, you know, we, we all weren't with each other the, the, all the time. So we would just talk about what we did and how things went, whether we did a good job or not. And we kind of made corrections on, on what we would do. Uh, we talked about our personal lives, you know, births, engagements, weddings, whatever it may be. Uh, it, it was also a time of healing. Because we would talk about runs that maybe bothered us that we had made recently. And really, sometimes it was nothing more than just one person saying, yeah, you know, that, that run we made yesterday or earlier today. And that was kind of messed up, wasn't it? And we all just sort of talked about it, and, and it let everybody know that they weren't alone. That, yeah, we all felt the same thing, and that we were together. We, we came around that table, and it made us one. We were brothers and sisters. It was a family that, that we had there. And so it gave us strength. It made us love each other. You know, Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, he, he wrote to the church there because they had taken the Lord's Supper and had, gosh, they had splintered off into groups and they were going off and having basically having feasts and some were even as gluttonous and going as far as they were, they were getting drunk and just sort of making a, a big meal out of it. While there were others there who, who didn't even have anything. And so he rebuked them and he corrected them. He said, look, you know, you're supposed to come together. This is where we come together. We come together as a family. And we, 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 we partake of the, the bread, the body. And we partake of the, the, the offering of the fruit of the vine in remembrance together of what Christ did for us. This, this bread that we, that we partake of, you know, we remember the fact that Christ came from heaven, his place in glory voluntarily came down to earth so that body could be beaten and, and, and he could die for us. And, and the, the blood that we, the, the fruit of the vine representing the blood of, of Christ that was shed, only his blood, only Christ's blood could give redemption for the whole human race. And so, and so that's why we come together as a family. Now, we come together around this table when we come together on Sundays. We come together with different skin color, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different educational levels, different points in our life. We have the newest members of our church. God bless these youth. We have the, the older elders and leaders of our church. But we all come together. And there's one thing that brings us together, and it's the fact that we're brothers and sisters in a family. And we are all members of that family together. That, that family, that church of Christ, that body of Christ. And so as we gather around this table today, it's an opportunity for us to stop and to think about that body that Jesus voluntarily came and gave up. That blood that he shed for us. So that that is the only chance any of us have for the remission of our sins for the entire human race. Going back to Adam himself. And it's also a chance for us to find a little bit 
of grace and love because as we think about those things, let us remember it was God's love that sent Christ to this earth. And it was Christ's love that was willing to make that sacrifice. And it's their love that heals us, that He is the one who heals us. And so as we partake of it this morning, let our minds concentrate on that fact. Let us bow. Lord, we come to you today and we're just so grateful, God, for the sacrifices that, that Christ made for us. Lord, as we partake of this bread, let us think about the place where Christ left to come to this earth in a, in a, a human body and to sustain the hardships of this life. Lord, not just for his sacrifice, but also the sacrifices he made his entire life living as he did to show us that he humbled himself completely and came to this earth for us. Lord, we ask that we partake of this bread in an acceptable manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray for the cup. Oh, Heavenly Father, we also pray, Lord, for the this fruit of the vine. We ask your blessings on it, Lord, as it represents your blood that was spilled, Lord. The, the, the blood of the lamb, the blemished, unblemished lamb, the only one that could save us, Lord, that blood that was freely given. Lord, we're so thankful for the sacrifice that was made for all of us as undeserving and unworthy as we are, Lord, we know that while we were all sinners, the Lord God did send you to come and die for us. Lord, we thank you so much. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. separate and apart from the Lord's Supper in our remembrance of the sacrifice that Christ made. We've set aside this time to also talk about and encourage those um, in our giving. And there's, there's several different ways, and for almost two years now, we've had these ways on the, the screen up here to, to give, so everyone's familiar with that. And if, if you haven't had the opportunity to be involved in what our contributions do with this church. You really, you really should, should, should try to get involved. My goodness, the, the money that goes towards the youth group, these wonderful kids that we have, what a great blessing it is. The outreaches that occur because of that. The, the ministry that's taking place in places away from here, that's all God's work. And that work can only be done because of the money that, uh, that is given back to Christ, given back to God here at the church. But I, I, want, I want to remind you of one thing. <clears throat> uh, I'm old enough to remember when companies and corporations would basically adopt a charity uh, at work. And so you could sign up for a, back then, really more of, I guess, a payroll deduction. And that money would go to that charity. And so basically that company sort of sponsored that charity. That was that company's charity. And so it kind of became a, a, a punchline that when someone approached you with a charitable need, you would always say, gave it the office. You may have heard that term, some of you young people, and sort of didn't know where it came from. But that kind of became, oh, I, I gave it the office. Okay. And so hopefully we all purpose in our heart what we're going to give to our church here every week or every month so that we can continue all these great works. But let us, let us always be mindful that separate and apart of what we do here, there are tremendous needs away from this church building that are put in front of us every day. And never let us look at those needs and say, well, I gave it to church. Everything that we have is given to us 
so that we can be a blessing to others. So never ever let us think that giving at the office or giving at the church is all the giving that we should do. Look for a need, see that need, and, and help with that need. God knows how important money is to all of us as humans. He mentions it so many times in the Bible that that's the sacrifice that shows we can actually show love with that blessing that's given to us. Let, us. let us bow and pray. Lord, we just are so thankful for the, the, the blessings that you give to us, Lord, our financial bounty that we have, the blessings every day. Lord, we just ask that you would, would, would fill us with your spirit, Lord, of love and giving, and that we would show others you inside of us by giving of ourselves, giving of our means, giving of all the things that we have to help others. Because we know, Lord, because you promised that you would always take care of us with everything that we need. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we'll sing uh, the Apostle song to allow our children to come forward and contribute to the fund for Jamaica. It will be one of our uh, Jamaican mission efforts will be uh, what this money will go for. Let's sing uh, the Apostle song. Jesus called them one by one, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They were all men for all of you, doubting Thomas and Matthew. Change the one they called the last, Simon also Thaddeus, the twelfth apostle Judas made. Jesus was by him betrayed. Matthias said, This world is not my home, I am just a passing through. They look from way down, some way beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven so below. And I can't feel their home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know, I have a friend like you. If heaven is not my home, then Lord, what will I do? times in life have you thought that you wanted to be at a certain place or see a certain thing only when it happens to find yourself disappointed perhaps it's a restaurant that you'd heard about people had talked about or you read reviews about 
and what great food they had. And you finally get an opportunity to go to the restaurant and you're disappointed. Food's not quite as good as you thought it was going to be. Or maybe it's a vacation spot that you had seen and heard about. And your family saves up, you finally go, and the place is nothing like the brochure. Or maybe it's even a foreign country, and you get to visit that place, only to be disappointed in the fact that it's not at all like what the internet said it was going to be like. There is a place that far exceeds our expectations. There is a place that we can only imagine. We sing about it. We read about it. We talk about it. And we long for it. It's a place called heaven. I begin to think this week how little we talk about heaven. And yet, as a child of God, heaven is everything. Heaven is what we live for. This world is not our home. And if we really believe that, then heaven should be something that we're always thinking of. Heaven should be something that we are longing for, that we look forward to. Maybe one of the reasons that we don't talk about it is because it's so hard for us to wrap our minds around it. It's so difficult for us to describe it. In the Old Testament, there's a story told of King Solomon and how the Queen of Sheba came to visit him to be in wonder of his splendor and his wisdom. In 1 Kings, she said to the king, the report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and your wisdom, but I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpassed the report that I heard. The same is true of heaven. It exceeds all of the songs that we sing. It exceeds all that we read about it. It exceeds the words that we might use to try to describe it. It exceeds all that we can ever imagine. Paul in 2 Corinthians caught a vision. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body. I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Paul was not permitted to talk about what he saw. And yet... In Revelation chapter 21, John was told that he needed to speak of the vision. That's where we're going to be today if you want to join us in your Bible. Revelation chapter 21, there in that book, John is warned by the angel not to close up the vision. God had given him a glimpse of heaven. And it's from that glimpse of that eternal city that we can only imagine. So today, for a few moments, I want us to imagine. I want us to set aside all that's going on in this world that we live in today. All the things that may be crowding your schedule. All the things that you may have planned for the rest of the week. For a few moments, can we just imagine about heaven? Can you imagine the city of heaven? Fifteen times in the last two chapters of the Bible, heaven is called a city. 
In fact, the Hebrew writer uses that same metaphor in saying, but as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And John provides an illustration here, in, or description rather, in chapter 21 of Revelation, when he says the walls of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And one of them who spoke with me had a message, a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls, and the city lie four square. Its length is the same as its width. And the measure, he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 strata. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its walls for 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. It's interesting here that, that John makes the statement by human measurement. In other words, by human measurement, here's what heaven looks like. 14,000 miles wide, 14,000 miles long, and 14,000 miles high. In verse 24, it says, By its light, with the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. I think that means that it's always going to be good there. There's nothing bad will ever happen. You'll never hear of a mass shooting in heaven. There'll never be any evil in heaven. There'll be no sin in heaven. Can you imagine? John tells us that the walls of the city will pay tribute to some. In verse 12, it says it had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed upon it. Perhaps there to remind us for an eternity of Abraham and his descendants and the nation through which the Christ would come. can only imagine. Verse 14 says, The wall of the city had twelve foundations. On them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Twelve apostles. I can only imagine that God would never want us to forget the testimony and the teachings through those men that allowed us even today to know about Christ. The most impressive thing of the whole city is this. It's the dwelling place of God. In verse 3, the Bible says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Did you notice the description was a perfect cube? There's only one other place that that talks about, a perfect cube, and that's the temple. In 1 Kings 6, it talks about a room inside the temple. A room that's 20 cubits long and 20 cubits wide and 20 cubits high. And that room was the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies represent the dwelling place and the very presence of God. And the point is this, that in verse 22 it says, I saw a temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb of God. Heaven is about you and I forever being in the presence of Almighty God. Forever. Can you imagine? Is it any wonder that the Bible says that Abraham searched for a city? And we too are pilgrims longing for a city, longing for heaven. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the security of heaven? Throughout the Bible, it talks about great cities with great walls. And so oftentimes those walls are seen as means of protection. 
Last week we talked about in the book of Nehemiah and how Nehemiah had gone back and had reconstructed the walls of the city. And one might ask, why would heaven need to have walls? Well, I suppose that it's a statement of the absolute security of that place. Because when Jesus returns, he will return as a judge and a warrior. He will come for one final time to ultimately, finally destroy all of his enemies. And there is no opportunity for a sequel. When Hollywood paints a picture or makes a movie, oftentimes the, there's that opening at the end for a sequel for the villain to return. One day Jesus will come back. And all of the enemies will be ultimately, finally, once and for all time, destroyed. And there is no opening for a sequel. In heaven, there will be no need for security cameras. There will be no need for metal detectors. There will be no need for security clearance. There will be no need for locks on the doors. Heaven is a place where we'll be secure from all of the stress and the worries that this life throws at us. The only thing close to evil in heaven will be the scars on the hands of Jesus. Think about it. You will never worry about anything ever again. Can you imagine? You'll never have to worry about your job because the only job you'll have is praising God forever. You'll never have to worry about money because you'll spend eternity in the riches of his glory. You won't have to worry about a place to live because he's going to hand you the keys to your mansion. You'll never have to worry about dying because you will have everlasting life. The greatest joy killer of this life is worry and stress. We worry about the pandemic. We worry about the future. We worry about uncertainty. We worry about our health. We worry about our children. We worry about so many things that this earth can touch and can affect. But in heaven, there is no worry. Can you imagine? Maybe you heard about the guy who worried about everything. His friends were worried about him because he, he was stressed out all the time. And then one day, it, it just like everything was great. And his buddy said, what's, what's changed? What's happened? He said, well, I have hired a professional worrier. I think I'm kidding some of those people. I've hired a professional worrier to handle all of my stress and to do all my worry. And their buddy said, well, what in the world? How does that cost? How much does that cost? He said, $10,000 a month. And their friend looked at him and said, how in the world can you afford that? He said, I don't know, I'll let them worry about that. 85% of the things that we talk to God about are needs. Think about that. God, I need you to fix this. God, I need you to take care of this. God, I need you to make this happen. All that changes Heaven's a place where we'll be secure from all the stress and all the worries that this life has thrown at us. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the beauty of heaven? It's like the little girl who was outside one night with her dad looking up in the sky and you could see all of the stars just everywhere. The sky was just so full of them. And the little girl looked at her dad and said, Dad, if heaven is this pretty on the wrong side of it, can you imagine what it's going to look like on the right side of it? Beautiful place. 
called heaven. And John's vision blows our minds as we think about it. In verse 18, he said, the wall was built of jasper while the city was pure gold like clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. I used to read all of this and wonder, is that literal? Is that figurative? Is this just somehow John's way of trying to bring it into human terms so that we can wrap our mind around it, so that we can get a little bit of an idea about what heaven might look like? But you remember when God created man, where did he place him? He placed him in a perfect paradise, in a place called a Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 2, it was a, it, there was gold in the land, and it was a precious metals there, and there was rivers that flowed through it. It was a perfect place. And when we get to Revelation chapter 22, it sounds much like Eden. And then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb and through the middle of the street of the city, and also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the trees were in the healing of the nations. The most beautiful thing about heaven is God will be there. Every day we'll be with Jesus. Remember the movie, Rudy? It was a story, a true story, about a young man whose lifelong dream was to play college football for the University of Notre Dame. But Rudy didn't have the grades to get in, and he didn't have the athletic mobility to get a scholarship. But he worked very hard. He went to junior college and he tried and he applied and he kept on and he kept on. And finally he was accepted and he got to go to Notre Dame and he got to walk on on the football team. Now to be a walk on means that you're basically a, a blocking dummy. And if you saw the movie, you know that every day Rudy showed up and he's got all these pads on and he's not a very big guy. I mean, he's not as big as those other football players were. And all he ever wanted to do was have an opportunity to dress for one game. And finally, the final game of his senior year came. And he called home and he told his dad that he was going to get the dress for the game. And he begged his father to come. And his father and his brother showed up at the game. And when his father walked out, he was a huge fan of Notre Dame walked into the stadium that was filled with people and a crowd and, and, and you had the atmosphere of the game. And that dad stood there. In a line in that movie, he said this, this is the most beautiful sight these eyes have ever seen. Well, let me tell you something. The most beautiful thing that your eyes will ever see heaven is when we open our eyes in heaven and we see God for the first time and we see Jesus for the first time can you imagine Bart Mallard was the lead singer for Mercy Me, contemporary gospel group. Bart's father passed away with cancer. It was during that time of personal challenges and pain that he sat down and began to write a song. One that became very, very popular. These are the words he wrote, surrounded by your glory, will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine 
I can only imagine. You know what the beautiful thing about all of this is? Nobody in this room has to imagine whether you can go there. Jesus died so that we could go to heaven. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how much he loved you to do that? Can you imagine what it'll be like to be there? Today, if you don't know Jesus, then heaven is not your home. But to know Jesus is to know that one day we get to leave this place with all of its sickness and all of its sadness and all of its junk and we get to go to heaven. Can Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. services and uh, when I got back to him he told me he was ready to be baptized this morning and we're so excited for him and Lynn and his decision to put on Christ and so Keith I'm going to ask you to stand I'm going to ask you a confession of your faith and then we'll baptize you in Christ do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God I know you do and uh, that confession is one that we all live by and uh, just a wonderful wonderful decision that you've made and we just so praise God for that so if you just go through here, we'll get ready. Thanks. If you can get a hold of a book, turn to number 902. 
didn't have time to get the slides together for this. 902. It's one that we all know pretty well, so if you can't find the book, you should be able to sing along with it. We'll sing this song while we're preparing for the baptism. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me quiet. upon the confession of your faith in Jesus Christ that I now have the privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost for the remission of your sins. Thank you. 